ahead and get started. Um, we're running a little bit late, so I don't want to uh, hold up the next talks. My name is Susan Howell. I'm a genetic counselor, and I'm also the clinic coordinator for the Extraordinary Kids Clinic here at Children's Hospital Colorado. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the genetics behind the conditions that we're here um, for today, X and Y chromosome variations. So how does this happen? Why does this happen? First of all, this is not your fault. Um, there's nothing that a person would do or not do that would cause this to happen. Um, it happens the same way that the majority of cases of Down syndrome happen, in which in either the um, biological process of creating the egg or the sperm, end up with an extra chromosome, or it can happen after fertilization as well, which I'll review. Often families talk about, or people talk about chromosome abnormalities relative to a mother's age, and some conditions are associated with what's called advanced maternal age. Um, to explain a little bit about advanced maternal age, we talk about women who are 35 years old and older at the time the baby is born. And there's a reason why, historically, why we chose the age of 35. Um, advanced maternal age was identified as being the risk of having a child with a chromosome abnormality equivalent to the risk of having a miscarriage caused by testing the pregnancy with the amniocentesis years ago. So they arbitrarily chose the age of 35 initially to start offering testing and labeled it advanced maternal age. Since then, um, the risks have come down. Amniocentesis has about a 1 in 500 risk instead of the 1 in 200 risk that was initially quoted. So that's changed, um, but the majority of children born with chromosome abnormalities are actually to women under 35 because there's more women under 35 having babies. The likelihood of having a, a, a second child after a first child is born with a chromosome abnormality is quoted as a 1% risk or the risk associated with the woman's age. So older women have uh, the potential to have a higher percentage risk than that. To review some terminology for this talk, chromosomes are the structures in a cell which carry the genes. Meiosis is the process where the chromosomes divide, creating egg, eggs and sperm. Non-disjunction is when chromosomes don't separate evenly. And aneuploidy is when you have an atypical number of chromosomes. Mosaicism is when not all cells are the same, resulting in different cell lines in a person. X inactivation is when a chromosome is, the X chromosome is turned off and the genes are inactive. And gene dosage refers to how many genes are expressed, so whether it's balanced or unbalanced. If we open up one cell in the body, we see a picture of something like this. These are chromosomes. And what the lab does is they stain them and put them into a picture oops, that looks like this called a karyotype. So in, our, in one cell in the body, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. The first 22 are numbered, 1 through 22, and they're ordered from largest to smallest, as you can see in the picture. And the 23rd pair of chromosomes are labeled with either an X or a Y. Males typically having 46 chromosomes with an X and a Y, and females having 46 chromosomes with two Xs. We get one chromosome in each pair from each parent. So in the first pair, for example, one number one is from mom, one number one is from dad, and so forth and so on. When we study chromosomes, the lab stains them to create what's called a banding pattern, and it allows us to see if there's any extra or missing chromosome material present. This picture um, orders the chromosomes based on size, and so you can see how relative the X chromosome is much larger than the Y chromosome, the size of the chromosome reflects the number of genes, so larger chromosomes carry more genes. So chromosome abnormalities occur with a high frequency. A loss is a monosomy or a gain is a trisomy of an entire extra chromosome, and they're the most clinically common conditions, but many other variations occur. The examples that I'm going to focus today on are highlighted in yellow and include XXY or Klinefelter syndrome, XXX, or triple X syndrome, or trisomy X, and XYY, also known as Jacobs syndrome. But there are several other X and Y chromosome variations as listed. So this is a picture of a karyotype from a male with Klinefelter syndrome. And you can see with the red arrow that it highlights the diagnosis made by the presence of an extra X chromosome. 
This is a picture of the karyotype of a female with triple X syndrome. Again, the arrow highlights the presence of an entire extra X chromosome. And this is a picture of a karyotype of a male with XYY or the presence of an entire extra Y chromosome. So I'm going to take you back to um, biology in high school to review how these conditions occur. Typical meiosis in a female. So meiosis is the process of creating eggs or sperm. So in a female, we're creating eggs. And I'm going to focus on just the X chromosome and the Y chromosome for the purpose of this talk. So we start with two X chromosomes in a female. And these chromosomes are unique and different as highlighted by the color differences. The DNA then replicates creating an identical copy of each chromosome. The chromosomes then separate, and this is a process called meiosis 1. And then the chromosomes then separate again, creating eggs that each contain one X chromosome through meiosis 2 division. The eggs are then fertilized by a sperm that either contains an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. And the fertilized egg either has 46 chromosomes with two Xs, which would be female, or 46 X XY, which would be male. Typical meiosis in a male, we start with an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. Again, the DNA replicates. The chromosomes then divide through meiosis 1. And then they divide again, creating sperm that contain either an X chromosome or a Y chromosome through meiosis 2. The sperm then fertilize an egg, which contains an X chromosome. And the fertilized egg, therefore, has 46XX female or 46XY male. So that's typically what happens. So if everybody's kind of good with that, I'm going to show you how it happens differently that causes these conditions. If we have a meiosis 1 non-disjunction in a female, so if in the first division the chromosomes fail to, to divide properly, this is what happens. Again, we start with two unique X chromosomes. The DNA replicates, and the chromes fail to divide in the first division of meiosis 1 error. And then they go on to divide, so you end up with eggs that have two X chromosomes. The empty eggs are inviolable. Meiosis, and that's through the meiosis 2 that you end up with the eggs with two X chromosomes. They're then fertilized by sperm that contain either an X or a Y, and the fertilized egg contains either 47 XXX, or 47XXY. If we have an error in the second meiotic division in a female, again, we start with two unique X chromosomes. The DNA replicates. They divide as they should in the first division of meiosis, but then they fail to divide properly in the second division. So you end up with eggs that have two X chromosomes that are identical. This is a meiosis 2 error. They're then fertilized by sperm that contains an X or a Y chromosome, and the fertilized egg then has 47XXX or 47XXY. If we have meiosis 1 errors in a male, we start off with XY, the DNA replicates, and they fail to divide. It's a meiosis 1 error. Then they go on to divide again, creating sperm that have an X and a Y chromosome in meiosis 2. The sperm then fertilize the egg with an X chromosome, and the fertilized eggs all have 47XXY. If we have a meiosis 2 error in a male, we start off with XY, <coughs> the DNA replicates as it should in the first division of meiosis 1, but then fails to di divide properly in the second division, creating sperm with either two X's or two Y's. This is a meiosis 2 error. They fertilize an egg with the, an X chromosome, and the fertilized egg has 47XXX or 47XYY. So conditions outside of XXY, triple X, and XYY, those are what I'm focusing on, can occur by multiple combinations of this. So I'm not going to go into detail to illustrate all of those, um, but sometimes there are errors in both meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. The other cell division um, that we talk about is mitosis. So on the left side of the picture, 
um, talking up here, this is an illustration of what happens in mitosis. And mitosis is the process that our body goes through of just dividing, one cell dividing to create two identical cells. So in typical cell growth, not the creation of eggs and sperm, but in typical cell growth, this is what occurs. The chromosomes replicate and then they create two identical cells. You can have mitotic errors. So at fertilization, you may have one chromosome as it should be in the sperm, one in the egg, and then the fertilized egg ends up as it should with the appropriate number of chromosomes. But when that fertilized egg goes on to divide, if there's a misdivision later in that mitotic process, you can end up with what's called mosaicism, in which you have two different cell lines illustrated by the colors here in one individual. So mosaicism is not all cells are the same, and there are different cell lines in an individual. And the impact is typically the, the presentation of the condition is milder. However, we test for these conditions in, in individuals by blood samples, and the blood may differ from other tissue types. So we can't test all the tissue types in, in the body. For example, we can't test what the um, mosaic cell lines might be in the brain, but we, we refer to that just based on what we see in the blood. We talk about mosaicism as a percentage or fraction of cells tested. Um, so we may talk about a 50-50 of two different conditions, or there can be a combination. And it's important to have follow-up testing when you have a diagnosis of mosaicism. A standard karyotype test only looks at approximately 20 cells, whereas follow-up testing for mosaicism, which we recommend FISH testing, looks at more than 200 cells. And it's a different type of test. Uh, we recommend just doing the FISH test for X and Y chromosomes for these conditions, depending on what was initially indicated with the karyotype. So what is a FISH test? Um, FISH stands for fluorescent in situ hybridization. And essentially, there are probes that are specific to chromosomes. So there's a probe specific to the X chromosome and a probe specific to the Y chromosome. And these probes, when they attach to the chromosome, fluoresce, or they light up, and they have a distinguished color. So the lab is able to look through the microscope and identify, based on the number of lights that they see for each chromosome. So if they see one light, it reflects the presence of one of those chromosomes, depending on the color. Um, and if they see two lights, then it would reflect two presence of the chromosome. This picture... Um, is just a general picture. It's not specific to X and Y chromosome variations, but it, it demonstrates this sperm actually in this picture has two green lights, which is reflective of the 21st chromosome. And for this picture, it's for Down syndrome. But you can see how this test is very different from looking at the actual chromosomes in a karyotype. So briefly to review where the extra chromosomes come from, um, when we talk about XXY overall, half of them come from the mother and half of them come from the father some of which are from after fertilization, or the post-zygotic mitotic divisions, which are the, the bottom um, row here. When we talk about uh, triple X syndrome, the majority come that of the extra X come from the mother, um, and there is a larger percentage that actually occur after fertilization. And then when we talk about XYY, um, because the Y chromosome has to come from the father, females don't carry it, 100% um, are from the father. So X inactivation. Typically males have one X chromosome and females have two. And so mother nature compensates in XX females by inactivating one of the X chromosomes and turning off gene expression on that X chromosome to balance out males and females. And the inactive X chromosome is inactivated early in embryonic development and typically random, um, in which the X chromosome is activated, inactivated about half and half. You would anticipate that in a female, you know, the, the chromosome from the mother would be inactivated 50% of the time, and the chromosome inherited from the father would be inactivated the other 50% of the time. For every X chromosome that an individual has more than one, they're inactivated. So if you have three X chromosomes, two of them are inactivated. There are regions on the X chromosome, however, called the pseudo-autosomal regions, which escape X inactivation. And these are small regions um, they continue, therefore, to express genes because they're not inactivated. And both the X chromosome and the Y chromosome have these regions. The, the region 1 is on the top, and the region 2 is on the bottom. Um, they're labeled as pseudo-autosomal, also stands for PAR. So X inactivation.
mutation with every X chromosome over one typically being randomly inactivated, but when you have a condition such as XXY or triple X, you're going to have more of those genes in the pseudoautosomal regions escaping X inactivation. So those individuals are going to have an extra dose of these genes. And it's thought that the overexpression of these genes in these regions cause the differences that we see in children with extra X chromosomes. The overexpression of these genes lead to more genes making protein, the extra protein causing multiple impacts in multiple systems, either upregulating or downregulating biochemical pathways in the body. And some of the genes in these regions that are thought to possibly impact the body include shocks, which has been associated with height, the ASMT gene, the protocadherin gene, and the neuroligin gene. We talk about an extra Y chromosome. Y chromosomes are not inactive. Um, the Y chromosome continues to express all of the genes, but as I illustrated previously, the Y chromosome is very small, and therefore there are a few genes on that chromosome. Again, the overexpression of these genes is speculated to cause the differences in children who have an extra Y. To talk briefly about a specific gene called the androgen receptor gene, it's a gene on the X chromosome. It is inactivated, so it's not in the pseudoautosomal region. And within this gene, there's a repeat of, um, of, of three letters called CAG, and these are letters in the DNA alphabet, if you will. And everybody has this gene, and everybody has this repeat, but the repeat can be very different from gene to gene in an individual as well as from person to person. The CAG repeat length has been inversely correlated with the functional response of the androgen receptor to the androgens. So what does that mean? That means that androgens being hormones or testosterone, for example, the receptor functions differently depending on the length of this repeat in that gene. Um, in XXY, it's been demonstrated that there's skewed X inactivation, which may occur in which the shorter repeat is preferentially inactivated, leaving the longer repeat active and expressed. And the longer repeat length has been associated with a shorter penile length, increased body height, decreased bone density, decreased testicular volume, and gynecomastia, whereas the shorter repeat length has been shown to possibly have a better response to testosterone therapy. So this is all being investigated through research. Um, our center is looking at this as well as several other centers across the country. And we're hoping to be able to have a stronger correlation that will impact um, how we practice medicine. So how are these variations diagnosed? Typically, it's through a routine or a high-resolution karyotype, which I showed you the picture of the chromosomes. And the cells are obtained either from blood or prenatally by amniocentesis or CVS. Um, a microarray analysis is also, also can be conducted in, um, in making a diagnosis. A microarray analysis is a much more detailed, um, microscopic, if you will, analysis of the chromosome. It costs a lot more than a routine karyotype, several thousand dollars. Um, and it's usually indicated when there's a complex situation in the child. We can also make the diagnosis from a cheek swab. Um, our, our center collaborates with a company called JS Genetics, and they have a kit that looks at the X chromosome um, as well as the Y. And then there's a new test that's recently come on board in late 2012 looking, it's called a non-invasive prenatal screening test, which I'll review. Prenatal testing, just to review, so amniocentesis um, tests the amniotic fluid from around the fetus. It's conducted usually at 16 weeks or later. It includes a test for what's called AFP or alpha feta protein, which um, evaluates for an open neural tube defect or a spinal defect. And the risk most commonly quoted for a miscarriage is 1 in 500 from this procedure. In a CVS, uh, this is a sample of the placenta is uh, obtained and, and analyzed for chromosomes. It's conducted between 10 and 12 weeks, so it's a little earlier. There's no AFP test, so there's no evaluation for open neural tube defects with this. And there's a higher risk of miscarriage of 1% or 1 in 100, which is most commonly quoted. Um, when they do these tests, they typically do the FISH test, which I reviewed earlier, looking at uh, the chromosomes that are more commonly found with aneuploidy. And that's usually a result that you get within 24 or 48 hours. And then they also do the follow-up karyotype that takes two weeks. So to talk a little bit about the new prenatal screening test, um, this is called NIPT testing, or non-invasive prenatal testing. So it analyzes what's called cell-free fetal DNA circulating in the maternal blood. 
So in a mother's blood, you can find fragments of fetal DNA during pregnancy. Approximately 10 to 15 percent of the DNA in maternal blood is fetal in origin, um, between uh, 10 and 22 weeks. And currently, it's considered a screening test and non-diagnostic, although this test has been shown to be very highly sensitive and specific. Um, again, it's available between 10 and 22 weeks of gestation. The benefit being there's no risk of having a miscarriage by having the mother's blood drawn. But the negatives are that because it's such a new test and it's also screening, the insurance coverage um, is minimal. The results are not always timely. Sometimes they take a, quite a bit of time. And they're not always conclusive either. So sometimes the lab comes back and says that a result was not able to be obtained. So there are four labs that are doing this test. Um, the oldest test just came out in December, and the most recent test came out in the middle of March. So you can see that these are fairly new tests. Each lab um, handles it differently. So not all labs test for all X and Y chromosome <coughs> variations. Some of the labs offer an optional test for patients to elect. Some of them include it in every test. So it, it, it varies depending on the lab used. Um, and we anticipate that there will be more newborn referrals from these conditions being diagnosed with the screening. We've already started getting patients, um, and our clinic hopes to play an important role with these referrals. To touch on the recurrence risk for um, X and Y chromosome variation, so I always encourage families to keep a copy of the karyotype or the lab report making the diagnosis. And this is because you give counseling very differently when you have a child who has an aneuploidy or the presence of an entire extra X chromosome or Y chromosome versus a translocation where maybe some of the X material is on a different chromosome or mosaicism. So all these conditions counsel differently. And so it's really important that the provider that you're seeing have a clear understanding of what the exact diagnosis is. Um, couples who have a child with an X and Y aneuploidy have approximately a 1% or the risk associated with the mother's age of having another <coughs> child with an aneuploidy. And individuals with an XY aneuploidy, and I have a, a fairly big range quoted here, have approximately about a 3 to 15 percent, it depends on the condition and the study that's citing it, um, risk of having a child with an X and Y aneuploidy. So um, there's a panel that's going to review our clinic, so I won't take up a lot of time, but our clinic here is a multidisciplinary clinic, and I have listed all of the professionals that are part of our team. Um, from various disciplines, um, and Dr. Tartaglia is our clinic director here. We have about 50% of our patients who come from out of state or out of country. Um, insurance often covers appointments, especially with the physicians, and then our clinic goal is to provide comprehensive clinical care, research, education, and support. I'd like to give acknowledgement to all of our patients, our wonderful team that I work with, KSNA and the XXYY Project for their undying support. Um, and my contact information is listed on the slide, and you're welcome to approach me um, with any questions that you may have. I think I ran over a little bit, so it probably would be best to um, take maybe one or two questions, and then we'll go on. Are yes. you just curious with the non-invasive? Yes. Tests, does, that, does that get complicated if you have multiples? Yes. Multiples, <coughs> obesity, gestational diabetes, all of these <coughs> issues can complicate whether or not a result is able to be obtained. Well, when you mentioned that the DNA replicates the X and the Ys, and then in some cases they come together, you have the same X, X, and Y, and the other one you have a, a different color. X, 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 and Y. Right. Does that manifest differently? Well, that's actually a great question. So that's another thing that we're researching here at our center is whether or not the origin of the chromosome impacts the phenotype or the clinical presentation of a child in our clinic. So we're looking at that, both where the, the chromosome came from, if it was from the mother and the father, as well as if they're a meiotic one or a meiosis two division, misdivision. And, then, and that's where you're looking One last question. Uh, on the, uh, the CAG link, uh, the shorter, better uh, therapies, what type of better or therapies, what, what examples are you talking about? It's just in comparison of the CAG repeat length. More assertive or more self confidence or, or what you mean? No, the, the response from the testosterone therapy, so a biological 
response and uh, how much they need, essentially. That's another thing that we're researching. So that hasn't been demonstrated. Um, but what these studies, it's based on how much the body actually needs. Is, is the body actually metabolizing the testosterone? I'd have to look back the at the actual studies. The short, you're looking at how the, you said one of those actually, the, the body responds better to testosterone in the tree. Right. On the shorter one. Whereas this, the longer one is shown to have less of a functional receptor. So is the difference the stage you like routinely? routine length? Uh, tested on stereotyping, or is that something no, that we have? it's only for research purposes right now, so it's oh, not so clinically you, available. You can't ask for that. No, not at this test. time. So you don't know if you're trying to go to the child which they have. Right. It's not clinically available, it's just being researched right now. And our clinic is one of the clinics <coughs> looking at that. So I ran over a little bit, it's actually almost 11.30, so I'm going to go ahead and step down and let the next presenter go.